Future by Design webinar series. Today we're talking about the future of identity at work. The Future by Design is all about creating a vision of what we would like the world to look like in the next 20 years. Imagine waking up in the year 2041. What do you see? What do you want to see? Today, uh, I am very honoured to be with Matt Smith. Matt started his career as a mechanical site engineer on large construction projects before becoming the Western Australia Northern Territory General Manager of a large maintenance services company. Matt could see significant waste and inefficiencies in traditional workforce compliance management processes. Companies large and small using multiple spreadsheets to manage safety, critical worker training and competencies, contractors onboarding and mobilization, a waste of time, money and frustrating for the workers in the process. This is when he started My Pass Global with a mandate to help companies in highly regulated asset intensive industries to reduce their risk and cost of operations. In 2020, MyPass Global won the AFR's Most Innovative Company Award in the Mining, Agricultural and Utilities category. Matt has a strong business improvement process and a desire to use technology to simplify and streamline processes. Welcome, Matt. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Great to be here. And another congratulations as well. You've just won some more awards just recently. Yeah, so uh, yeah, just in the last week, actually, we won the Australian Business Awards um, first place for process innovation, um, which we're which we're wrapped with as well, and then also um, Sydney Water actually just had a, a week long festival of innovation with a sort of Shark Tank style, and we fortunately won the uh, safety category there too. So yeah, it's been a good week. Incredible. And so I do have to ask you, uh, why do you do what you do, or are there any defining moments? over your career that have led you to be where you are now? Yeah, good question. So as, as you sort of said in the introduction there, I'm a bit of an efficiency freak and, and I also like a challenge. So you know, it doesn't matter whether it's passing through airport screening or, or, or what I was doing in my day job, I like things to, to be streamlined and, and not to waste effort and, and resources. So this was a problem that was close to my heart where in fact, you know, as a young general manager, hand on heart, I didn't have that assurance that everyone on site was trained and competent to do their tasks. And what that means is, you know, people's lives are at risk when, when they're in that situation. So I guess what motivated me was to, I guess, solve that problem and, and put my industry hat on and think, how do you holistically solve this rather than just accepting the status quo, accepting manual keying, accepting you know, information gaps out there. So yeah, that, that was a journey that started eight years ago. Wow, congratulations. You talk about empowering individuals. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, so you know, one of my core beliefs is that people should have um, access to their own information. They should have information in a timely manner to, to do their best work and, and to operate safely and, and come home safely. And I think one of the fundamental flaws of the way data and information has been traditionally managed is that companies have sort of held that on behalf of the individual. And so you end up with all these silos, particularly if people have moved between organizations or, or sites of which they work. And there's no one single source of truth. And the individual doesn't necessarily know A, where their information is, B, where all their training is, if they've got multiple licenses or, or degrees and so forth. Um, so this is really about empowering the individuals to stay on top of their training, to understand what career pathways there can be for them in their, in their chosen field, um, keeping them safe by making sure that there aren't gaps when they go out there and get deployed, and also a means of them communicating too. So empowering through actually having really clear communication channels, even if it means if, if they're a transient worker or a casual worker, um, where the next role is where the next deployment is and having having sort of that 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 chat functionality as well so yeah all about basically what we call privacy by design and and um, making sure individuals are in control is, is the crux of it that's really cool and I'm not sure if I've actually shared my background in a past life I did actually have an engineering company and we had oh, there we go. 84 staff. We did large scale process control and automation, primarily mining and utilities. And at the time, we actually grew from 16 to 84 staff in a year and a half. 
and it was uh, this was back in 2008 2012 so I'm quite familiar with the process and at the time we actually had our uh, junior receptionist and then we had someone um, well when we actually grew we had our receptionist who then become the HR person and um, we put her through a traineeship program to do her HR certifications and then as we grew put someone on to her to then do reception and so I'm very familiar with the amount of paperwork and the filing systems of organizations and how it works do you think there's been a trend or a mindset where we've just been um, our hands have been tied a little bit with technology and the ability to be able to do things in a more efficient process yeah there's, there's a few dynamics there I think one is that there's a there's an intersection of a few technology trends here. So one is that um, you know, people are just interacting more and more on their on their smartphones clearly, and and they're they're more comfortable now with with even storing and handling that information um, at their fingertips now. So that's kind of one dynamic is the individuals are kind of showing more interest. The other is the appetite to go to the cloud a lot more as well. So lots of organisations that would traditionally have things like big ERP platforms. You know, stored stored off the cloud and now coming to the cloud. And what that does is opens up the ability for um, technology solutions to actually interoperate through integrations and therefore allow the data to move without it being siloed and, and removing all that manual keying. So I think that trend as well is really helpful because that's really been a key enabler for us to, to sort of unlock um, solutions to problems that aren't just solving it at an at an organization level, but allowing even between organizations to have a common sort of technology infrastructure that they can all collaborate within. So an example of that is um, organizations that would typically have to check the competency of an individual independently of each other. And, and we've just been chosen as a technology partner for, for a chamber of minerals and energy initiative called Verisafe, where um, it doesn't matter if, if say a Chevron or a BHP or a Woodside checks the competency of an individual that can be recognized across multiple organizations. But to have that recognition, to have that visibility of that attainment, you need common infrastructure. And so it all kind of ties together now where there's an appetite from the industry to collaborate more. And, and there's also the intersection of technology, which makes that possible. And, and you need all of them. Um, you can't just have one without the other. You can't just have the technology, but people are, are wanting to I guess not make compromises around what some of that simplification and standardization needs to be. And so what do you think of the mindset? The mindset is, and there's probably two big categories here in this trend, the mindset of individuals where before they had to go and do a medical or they had to go and do all these things and just hand over their information to their uh, employer. And then also then the mindset of the organization itself as these trends are coming into play. Yeah, spot on. So, you know, if I was to summarize that, it's, yeah, that's exactly right. And I guess people knowing how much more efficient things can be, that they don't have to be, um, you know, reprovisioning the same information time and time again. And, and you know, people kind of recognizing the smarter, faster ways, even just simple things like people used to have, you know, hundreds of different passwords for all these sites, whereas now you can have you know, applications where it's just one vault for your password or you can sign on to everything with Google or Facebook. You know, people are expecting now that I've got data, um, I've got information on me, why should I keep giving that to you as an organization provider with a caveat that, that you're, you're an organization that can be trusted with that. So, you know, we trade heavily on that trust and, and providing a trusted network that that individual can operate in and, and, and give and revoke permissions at any stage. And then similarly with the organizations, they're realizing that things like keeping people safe at work is not proprietary. You know, it's not something that they need to keep as organizational IP. If there's ways of actually simplifying, standardizing and sharing for industry, then, then why wouldn't you do it? So it's, it's that kind of mindset as well, where everyone gets basically a reduced risk and cost benefit rather than on this big, large organization, I'm going to put in this clunky sort of solution i'm going to use spreadsheets or whatever i don't care because we're big enough and you know we'll just throw more overheads at it that's that's gone if there's ever a time for industry to be more collaborative so that they can be um sort of i guess linking arms and 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 being more internationally competitive together now's the time you know you look at some of the sectors with 
we were spawned out of. Now, as you know, we're diverse into sort of health and aged care and volunteering, but uh, our, our roots have been in energy resources. Like that's that sector's coming under a lot of pressure at the moment externally as well. And you know, you've just got to collaborate. There's no no sort of option now just to say we're big enough and profitable enough that we're just going to sort of charge on our own. And yeah, it's, um, I guess it's inevitable. And you talk about privacy by design. Are they, there's a couple of different things that you sound like you're doing them by design. So I love to, to think about how do we actually want the industry to look in the next 10 years and then you make it as you see it. Uh, what does that mean to you? Yeah, you know, what that means to me is that it's firstly it's a business model where, where we anchor our model on the individual and that individual um, organizations only be associated with that individual because they had um, that individual either applied to work with that organization or they're already known to that organization and got invited so it's not a kind of create a big pool of individuals that anyone can dip into and potentially privacy can be compromised. So basically the individuals and controllers to who has access, that's that's kind of a business model point of view. But um, the others is is really looking at what what approaches and technology are out there to um, to do your best to, to protect that privacy. So examples are where we're certified to the international ISO certification for information security, which is information security 27,001. There's only 200 organizations in Australia that have that. And that's kind of our license to operate. What that means is, you know, even the people we employ who might have access to that information have to go through background checks. It means that we do constant training with our individuals. We pay companies to try and penetrate our system digitally um, through cyber attacks so that we can look for vulnerabilities, you know, all, all that type of thing where, you know, we're trying to do everything we can to create that trusted network. Um, and then we're also talking to specialists out there to how to beef up even knowing who you say you are. So the, the actual cornerstone of what we're doing as well. So it's great to have a single source of truth for an individual within the industry and across industries. But, you know, how do I really know you, Lisa Andrews? Well, we could, you can upload your government ID and we can check it and all the rest of it, which is what we do as part of our verification process. But how can we automate that more? How do we detect for fraud more using, you know, algorithms and so forth and, and image recognition? And how do we anchor that identity better, um, which ultimately one day might be off our, you know, type of uh, government identifiers, but also even just biometrics. Um, we're looking at partners there that really specialize in that aspect so that when you log in, you know, through facial recognition and not just an uploaded license um, and biometrics, we can actually make sure we're dealing with the same individual. So it goes right back to that, that piece. And, and where this becomes really important, um, you know, unfortunately in the media, there's been um, some publicity around, you know, sexual harassment in the workplace, particularly in the energy resources sector and, and some sort of, you know, unacceptable behaviors that have been happening and if you don't anchor on the identity of that individual what's been happening is that they end up in another shirt the next day with another employer and 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 the organization who who owns that asset is, is exposed because it's very hard to kind of have that traceability of an individual if they're not uniquely identified so there's a whole lot of byproducts that come off um that sort of unique id of an individual I was having a conversation yesterday, actually, and we were talking about pattern recognition and how AI and software can actually recognize that it's you by when, even when you log into your computer, your standard pattern of what you open first and how you do it, uh, when you're driving your car, uh, how your, your foot is on the accelerator or the brake, we have all of these different patterns, even the gate, the way that we walk, that recognises our unique identity. So when you're talking about biometrics, it's interesting to see how that will be used in the workplace in the future. Yeah, absolutely, spot on. And so at what point do you put that into your tech roadmap for the business? So you're talking about, um, you know, implementing different and working with different organisations now to be able to certify uh, people's identity. Um, is it something that you were talking about privacy by design as well and you're looking after the individual and the individual first? Um, how does that play into your tech roadmap? Yeah, that's a good question. So our roadmap is... Is, is all again anchored around that individual and making sure we do that really, really well. So that digital wallet or digital passport, skills passport that they have, 
all those components of of what it means to to be kind of compliant and competent um that we're accessing those components um in the best possible way and giving organizations the greatest assurance so that means yeah, integrating with as many data sources as we can as a key part of that so we're not um i guess exposing ourselves from a combination of automated and manual verifications so that's that's one kind of pillar um, another one is is really knowing the role that we play in terms of that verified data set around the individual and and being quite willing to partner with any technology that needs that so examples could be um, site access or logistics or downstream hr systems or um, learning management whatever it might be they all require a, a feed of verified data to go into them so what, what we don't want to do and we've been we've had this game plan since day one we don't want to be all things to all people we don't want to have a module for everything um, which is the traditional approach we want to do this part really really well and have transferability and portability with the individual and groups of individuals um, rather than build a whole lot of tech and so if, if we can collaborate in that ecosystem and empower downstream systems that need to know who the individual is that needs to know elements around their health and well-being even COVID status so you know we're tracking COVID vaccination certs now as well um all that data set is, is super valuable so yeah our our roadmap is all built around beefing up the identity of the individual and assurance around that beefing up the way we verify that information and partnering with with the issuing sources and then being as flexible as possible with with other solutions hardware software in that ecosystem connected worker all that type of thing um so that we're playing a playing a functional role rather than trying to do everything brilliant now i did actually get the opportunity to see your digital platform and when we talk about skill, skills shortages and we talk about workforce planning and uh, different certifications, I understand from the level of the engineering firm that I had. And so having 84 staff underneath, understanding their skills and what our skills gaps are. And I also know how hard it is to find staff. Your platform actually showed on a, an industry level uh, and can show more than just the organization level of different skills. Can you share a little bit more about that? Because I was totally blown away. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's sort of where, where the vision's be getting bigger and bigger in terms of where I see the potential of how we can help out here. And yeah, you're right. Ultimately, um, whilst we're not creating a marketplace of individuals and we're protecting that individual's information and, and, and we're not, not, not sort of putting that out in the public domain, the privilege of our situation is we can see the data in aggregate, de-identified data that kind of gives us a, a high degree of granularity as to what skills and competencies are where within the organization. So, you know, that heat map you're referring to, Lisa, you know, if, if there's skill shortages in regional areas, we can actually you know, if there's enough critical mass of individuals on our platform actually identify for either industry or government or whoever it might be what those actual gaps are so there's actually plans that um, at that government industry level that can be put in place with actually a, a, a research basis to it where if you're trying to get an individual from here to here where you're mapping the skills of the future with what you have right now and the pathway to get there you know, we, we can play a role in that by by providing you know de-identified information to help organizations do that and, and we're we're doing that we're having these discussions right now with various industry bodies and, and government um, organizations which is a really neat kind of use case and if we can play some role in, in helping individuals upskill to you know empower them to to take on new skills that matches where the industry is going that's a pretty nice um nice role to play there to bridge that I love it. And there's so much fear around people losing their jobs or the future of work and what does it mean? And I know uh, Deloitte actually did a really great white paper on the future of work around heads, hands and hearts. So the different roles and the skills and a national level around that, which was super cool. I guess for, um, for your approach around the individual, you've got that ability then to help them design their career as well. And so uh, I always like to refer to history. And if you think about 
in the last uh, 100, 200 years, industrial revolution, people tied their identity to the role that they did and the skill that they had. And, um, you know, they might have been a certain part of a process, uh, whereas now they might have multiple careers, they might have multiple jobs and roles, but they also do need to look into the future of what's going to be needed. So is that um, your, your thoughts on helping people design their career around this? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And those are kind of the, the building blocks that I was referring to is if we can help people understand based on what they have and have real granularity down to that, which could be a mix of licenses, um, you know, uh, tertiary education, it could be um, various, uh, you know, CPD and, and modules around professional development. Um, if, if we can help them understand where they are and what that pathway could be and, and and we're starting to do that we're starting to make recommendations through through the interface for the individual now around you know for example if you're an electrician if you did a cert for an, an instrumentation you could actually be a, a, an electrical and instrumentation technician which gives them a bump up in pay it fills gaps for the for the future so i think that's really exciting and what i what i think is exciting too is we're having you know some really interesting discussions around um how you build that capability profile or that skills profile of an individual where it's becoming not as granular anymore around you know TAFE qualifications university qualifications and licenses it's some of the task-based skills some of the online learning some of the the um, micro credentialing as well um, which is comprehended within our data model so when you look at some of those softer elements there's kind of no limit to what um, configuration of tertiary licenses, quals, micro-credentialing could create to equate to a role. So we're kind of aligned with that approach you're talking about of not being too prescriptive about what a role is because we can take a mix of any inputs to that role and, and match them through, through skills matrices to make sure that people are getting what they want rather than you either fit into a box or you don't. So I have to ask what industries do you feel like you're going to need um more people in the future so are you seeing any trends at the moment are there any particular skills that people could be looking at upskilling in yeah i'm seeing it across the board at the moment all the discussions we're having everyone's really struggling for skilled capable people i'll, I'll give some examples um you know one one which jumps out at me is is age care and, and disability care um where you know there's several hundred thousand uh, aged care workers that are needed to meet demand over the next five years. And there's plenty of reports and evidence out there where, you know, it's great that the government's investing in creating more capacity, but I'm speaking to aged care providers that can't put their hands on staff. And we're not, you know, a, a lot of this is a perfect storm with the fact that Australia isn't being able to bring people in on visas or, or have any migration happening during COVID. So that's putting um, the whole country in a, in a really challenging situation where there's massive chronic shortages and there aren't the people there and there aren't the people trained to do it. Um, you know, mining sector, for example, big skill shortages exacerbated by border closures. If you're not in WA, you can't service, you know, a third to a half of the energy resources sector now. So that's kind of put them on, on the back foot. Um, even another example in, um, in the agriculture sector, we're having discussions where there's a whole lot of fruit that's going to be plowed into the ground um, at the end of the season because there weren't enough people to pick the fruit. They used to come from the Pacific Islands and, and all sorts of different places to do that. And they haven't been, been able to, you know, New Zealand and the building and construction space, it's, it's endless. Everyone I speak to has got the same challenge. And I think, you know, part of it is relatively temporary with, with our border closures to, to, to others that might fill those um, requirements, but, when you overlay that with the way the industry is going, where you need people to be more tech savvy to understand, you know, that their roles are going to be more dynamic, more sort of, um, you know, focused around around technical skills and capability as as we evolve with with the way we innovate. You know, there's a perfect storm there where where, where it's a pretty tough environment if your organisation trying to bring on capable people, and I, I can't see it letting up anytime soon unless we kind of rally together and actually plan ahead by bridging those gaps we just talked about with what the industry needs and what what individuals actually have and do it in a really smart structured way 
It's so cool. The more and more conversations that we have around this and just hearing that it's a huge trend at the moment. You know, one of our faculty members, uh, Sophia Semio, has INS and they do career workforce planning, but they're actually getting engaged by companies a year or two before they're about to make people redundant and then help helping to reskill them before that date so that they're eligible and, you know, helping them get a job in the next role. Are you seeing that with organisations as well? where they're actually learning on the job for future skills that might, they might need, even if it's not in the organisation they're with? Yeah, um, in some cases, yes. So uh, one example of that is um, in the automotive sector. This is going back a couple of years now, but um, individuals that were getting displaced from obviously the shutdown of, of some of the facilities, particularly in South Australia. And yeah, organizations wanting to bridge those skills, which, you know, particularly if you're looking at some of the factories like Toyota, for example, they're big on, on continuous improvement and business improvement. They have some really good ways of operating in a lean manner and, and really making sure supply chains are very efficient. Um, you know, they're finding their way into, into some of the core sectors I've seen. And, and even um, when you look at, uh, repatriating people who have who've been in the um, defence force as well. So, for example, you know, people that have, have been in logistics and planning roles in the defence force make really good maintenance planners and schedulers because they're very methodical and they're trained well and so forth. So, yeah, definitely seeing that interplay in a few areas. And even in um, New Zealand at the moment, there's a lot of government funding behind um, skills transition. So they've actually got funding behind deliberate projects to take people that are working in, in um, the energy sector or oil and gas sector and mapping out how they transition them to the skills that they need for more renewable energy projects and skills, be it engineers or otherwise. So yeah, definitely seeing it um, happening in that area as well. So if people are fearful about the future, and I know a lot of people think that technology is going to take their jobs, uh, what's your view on the mindset of, um, you know, where that sits and knowing that a lot of these things are going on? Are you positive that there'll still be work in the future? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, yes, I do think there'll be work in the future. I think the key component here is that... Um, in Excuse me. Individuals need to be uh, need to be agile and need to evolve. I think the ones that that will limit their options in the future are those that kind of put their head in the sand and say, oh, "I don't, I don't need to learn that new skill, or I don't need to be more agile, or I don't need to innovate. I'm just going to keep doing my job." I think those are the ones that are at risk. And and the research I've looked at in this area, it got quite nicely described to me as a dumbbell, where um, in terms of the distribution of the workforce, we're at one end of the dumbbell. You've got a nucleus of workers who will be very hard to replace because it's very hard to automate some of the nuances of the physical hands-on labor. So, you know, sectors like construction, there's just so many moving parts and things. There's certainly some wins that the sector's having around, you know, introducing robotic rigging and, and AI and so forth. But fundamentally, there's a lot of work that's very hard to swap out with a robot. So, so those jobs are relatively safer because it just, how hard they are to automate. And then at the other end of the dumbbell, there's a nucleus of very technical roles, people at the cutting edge of you know, programming. And, and again, I'll use the example of robots, programming robots and, and training and AI and that kind of pointy end. There's clearly going to be lots of work there. It's the ones in the middle of the dumbbell um, who, who probably need to make sure they evolve because it's, it's the, the roles which are quite repetitive and logical and can be sort of automated that are the ones that are probably most at risk, which could be, you know, people, for example, doing tax returns or even some aspects of repetitive nature of some of the, the subsets of the legal profession or, or, or something like that, you know. Um, those are some of the roles that probably are most likely to, to be displaced rather than the other ends of the spectrum. So I thought that was a nice analogy I've, I've sort of looked into before. That's really cool. And I'm actually reflecting on the title of the webinar. We're talking about the future of identity at work, which we're talking about digital identity and being able to prove your certifications and whatnot. There's kind of another spin on that of your actual identity with your role and what you actually do. 
And you know, we talk about everyone um, being, you know, a polymath now and being a generalist and knowing a lot about different things and being agile and being able to jump in and there's always work when you're flexible. What does that actually mean for identity, do you think, if I can put that different spin on the title of our webinar? Yeah, gosh, interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. So it loops into what I was just saying before about individuals need to be agile and flexible and, and not just stuck doing the same thing. Uh, a, a mentor of mine basically said, you know, fundamentally, if you're in a high growth company that's scaling, which, which we consider ourselves to be, what you're doing in 12 months time should be fundamentally different to what you're doing today. And, and so as you're growing, it might mean that you, you used to wear multiple hats and now, you, now you've got to sort of share your Lego, so to speak, and let someone else build their own tower. Or it may mean that, that you're going up in the organization and you're taking a senior role or you're becoming more specialized and so forth. So, yeah, I think people need to treat themselves as a, as a brand and, and, and to build skill sets and capability over and above trying to chase role titles or salary. And, and that's the approach I'll always take is to build skills and capability, make sure I'm learning and, and adding value and, and, you know, trying to obviously find that intersection of what interests me and what an organization needs, but fundamentally try and be on that learning journey. And that was one of the reasons that triggered me into starting this business is I felt like I was too in control. It was too, it was too, um, yeah, I was just too in control. I, I, I knew what I was doing. I had a rhythm and I wanted to be challenged. I want to be outside my comfort zone. So that's, that's the approach I've always taken to, to continually evolve. I love thinking about it as personal branding. I think you mentioned earlier about, you know, if someone does something wrong, then, you know, the next organization is at risk and they don't know that. But when someone does something well as well, and so how you show up and how you do one thing is typically how you do everything. So, you know, that is going to follow people throughout their career. And that's where the superstars will rise um, when they're really good at what they do, where they have passion and purpose and just jump in and do the job, then that's going to continue out throughout their career. Yeah, 100% agree. And there's probably another element I'll, I'll add to that as well, which is, you know, using technology for good as well, rather than just for, you know, innovation's sake. And you know, a lot of our team is really proud that we're kind of supporting, you know, for example, the volunteering sector with the work we're doing with the Victorian government and, and we volunteer. And, you know, it's kind of really satisfying for me personally. It wasn't part of the original vision, but the fact we've got the same technology that helps a highly skilled offshore oil and gas worker being used to, to pool and mobilize volunteers in time of need for vulnerable Victorians. And now that's getting, you know, extended into emergency response. It's, it's kind of great to know there's, there's real people out there that we're helping connect um, with organizations that need the support using the exact same technology. And whilst it might be a simplified version where you might just need a first aid certificate and a working with children's or working with vulnerable persons check that goes in their my pass passport, you know, it's, it's those types of things where you know, our team's kind of celebrating because it's it's like great you know there's there's a diversity of the application of the technology here and it's not just sort of a um you know capitalist model of building a great technology company that that that's financially successful it's how can you innovate for impact as well that's very cool so it, we always talk about the world's biggest problems are also the world's biggest business opportunities and it's really interesting to see when you're actually solving a problem that's real the traction that you get and you've already expanded into those other industries and I think uh, it's a good message for a lot of the startups and small businesses that are looking to grow and scale out there when you actually just tap into something that's right and that works the momentum and the traction comes so congratulations on that and uh, oh, thank you it hasn't been it hasn't been an easy journey so yeah thanks <laughs> and, and so let's talk about innovating for impact so, you know, you did start your journey solving frustrating problems. How has that journey been? Yeah, it's, it's gone really well. As, as we sort of talked about, if, if you've got a problem that you want to solve enough, um, then, then I think people will get there. And, you know, one of my strengths, I guess, is that I'm, I'm, I'm quite resilient in that regard. I'll keep going and going because if, if I believe in it, I believe there's a problem out there to be solved. And, you know, when I, when I sat back and realized 40% of the process is done on spreadsheets when it comes to getting someone job ready and, and deployed, you know, that, that tells me there's a big prize out there for getting it right. So, yeah, I'm, I'm super proud of the fact that, 
you know, we're, we're approaching critical mass in a couple of sectors at the moment and, and getting some good footholds and others like that, that says we're making an impact and, and we're actually getting multiple layers of that supply chain all engaged simultaneously. And so that's really important too, that a model where everyone gets a benefit rather than a one-sided deployment where there's a winner and a loser by the introduction of that innovation or that technology. And so the fact that, you know, we can, we can be a great partner for those that, that issue training and, and, you know, get benefit from that training being portable for their trainees. We have a direct benefit for the individuals who are empowered and can track their license expiries and more efficiently connect with organizations and get, get more work and upskill themselves. The organizations can reduce their risk and cost of operations. And then the ultimate um, consumer of that, that labor or that resource, be it a site facility, um, hospital, whatever it might be, the fact that they can get that aggregated view too, and they're willing to join the ecosystem. Like that's, that's been a really satisfying thing for me too, where we kind of set out for a model where, where everyone gets a benefit. And, and so that, that kind of impact's been really satisfying. And so, you know, as you started at the outset, it's just nice to know there's some, um, some recognition coming with that uh, in terms of some of the, the industry awards and so forth. Um, and then, as I mentioned too, you know, impact around, you know, hopefully over time improving the standards in, in disability care and aged care because people are, are, are better tracked and better than, you know, there's, it's more clear to the individual how to do, do their best work because the, the industry's got together and agreed on what minimum standards and training are. So there's a lot of elements like that where I truly believe we can make an impact. And you know, I've got this funny, funny kind of future vision in my head that you know one day I'll be in some kind of retirement home or rest home and whether it's my past or something else you know I'm, I'm going to be asking that person you know show me you're trained and competent to to look after me and and, and there's no reason why that data and that evidence shouldn't be there and there shouldn't be a a, a credibility track record that goes for that individual um rather than us sort of blindly trusting people at the moment you know knowing knowing instead of trusting that's a, it's a, um, it's brought up a couple of things for me there. How big is the market and, and how big do you want the business to be? Would you like this to be in all industries, all sectors, in Australia, internationally? What's the future vision? Yeah, so for us, it's gaining, it's not going for everything at once. It's, it's creating, the way we create impact is getting critical mass one sector and geography at a time. So whilst, you know, we apply from everything from volunteering through to oil and gas as a basically covers everything in between, right? From, from agriculture through to education, um, healthcare, everything kind of sits in between that. So yes, I, I have a vision that we can work across a lot of industries, if not all industries. Yes, I see no reason why we can't play a role either you know, plugged into others with a with an agreed data model where we might be one of multiple, but there's no reason why we can't be, you know, that that skills passport that, you know, the majority of Australians might use an extension to 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 some of the other tools and, and apps that they might use to prove what they're capable of doing. And then internationally, next year is going to be a really big year for us. We've just secured our, our first client in Canada. We've got um, a massive opportunity in um, North America and in the US, which is which is evolving now, and also in South America. So those are kind of our next frontiers there. We're already hiring our first Spanish-speaking staff. We're already working 24-7 around the clock with support. So we're getting ready for that international expansion now, which, which is imminent. And, and again, we're not going to try and cover all geographies at once because for us to make an impact, we need sort of that, that critical mass. And so, yeah, the answer is yes, but in a careful way of um, yeah, making sure we, we, we really make an impact one sector and geography at a time rather than spreading ourselves too thin. I really love the the way that we'll have that ability to make an impact now. And we talk about, you know, how to how do businesses impact a billion people? And that's our big question all the time. And we're asking them, and there's 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet. But one of the realizations that I had just recently is that a lot of these technologies are actually building the infrastructure. So it might not actually be those 7.7 .7 billion people alive today. It's creating the legacy for the future generations that they're just, they'll be born into this framework of 
how things are and they'll just naturally have privacy. They'll just naturally be able to um, understand that large scale and where the skills gaps are and, and where they can actually focus their attention. Um, did you actually go in thinking that you could impact a billion people or is that um, in your mind possible? Definitely possible, definitely possible. And um, yeah, we've I've, I've had my thinking expanded. We're really fortunate um to have, have just brought on on an advisory basis um a really gun chief technology officer a cto that's built 31 technology products before including you know big brands like afterpay and that's exactly what we're planning out now you know how do we make an impact in 50 countries simultaneously what does the infrastructure need to be you know how do we build a roadmap to get there um so yeah it's absolutely within the realms of what we think is possible provided again we do it in a in a structured strategic way for sure and uh, i'm just uh i'm getting excited now because you're starting to get into data and frameworks and numbers and stats and i have to ask you given that you are a framework person are you um, measuring sort of kpis and do you have those future targets on a vision board somewhere yeah so there we keep bumping up what those targets actually are um but our, our magic metric is what we call worker or individual community connections. And what that represents is a connection between an individual and an organization. And that's that's kind of our measure of value. If we've connected an individual to one or more organizations, um, then that's, that's a unit of value that we can sort of be proud of. It's better than how many users are using the system or even how many people have you know, got their skills passport set up. It's that connectivity piece. So our our vision is to empower safe, agile and connected communities. So it kind of aligns with the vision. So that's really what we track. So, you know, we're trying hard to to grow that and and to answer your question. Yeah. In the next few years, it's it's sort of trying to create millions of those connections. We're already in the hundreds of thousands. We're trying to get to the millions. And then, as you say, there's no reason why we can't keep expanding that sort of to the billions. Yeah, it's no wonder that you're winning all these amazing awards. And we're talking about uh, a future by design and we were talking earlier, what is your strategy around each of those? And it sounds like you've got all these metrics and you're so focused strategically. Do you have any secrets that you can share with people? Uh, around the st strategic side? Yeah, so you're putting out the numbers and I know um, even when we were talking about the awards and at the beginning of the year, you sat down and you sort of have a look at what are the key ones that are actually relevant to you, things like that. Are there some key things that you do in business that has help you get where you are? Yeah, good question. Um, to me, the key thing that's helped get to where I am now is trying to build as strong a network as I can around me. I was just talking to one of my colleagues about that this morning. Um, you know, relationships are important to me, you know, reciprocating, helping people out uh, where I can as well. And I'm just really blessed to have a, a really good network around me of, of advisors, of investors, um, of people I can bounce off who are, who are a few more steps down the path than me. And and I invest a lot in that, not because I think it's strategic, it's because it's just the way I'm wired to be, right? And, and what that's created is ultimately diversity of investors, diversity of advisors, diversity of team. We've got a very diverse team. We have up to 63 people in our team. When we first started talking probably six months ago, it was about half that. Um, so we've got diversity of thought coming in. And ultimately, one of, one of the things that, that I truly believe in is our business success is going to come from the people, how we empower our own people, how we give them meaningful work within our business, how well they lock into the vision, how well they have the ability to develop their own careers and 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 um, be fulfilled. If we do that well, the results will come. So I've I've been making a more and more conscious decision as I've as I've seen the success that we're generating and that we could generate to be this big global powerhouse. The temptation is to focus on the output and you know what the business might be worth one day and whatever. I'm channeling that energy back into saying, you know, people not profit. If I can focus on, you know, people that really enjoy what they do, that are that are contributing well, the results will come. And that that's a byproduct of looking after the people. So the short answer to your question is focusing on the people 
and getting that right, getting the culture right, getting the right people in the right seats, giving people the chance to learn and grow, that's core to my strategy. If we do that well, then everything else will, will unfold. That's very cool. As we're talking about impact, I love um, the more I learn about what the world's challenges are, the more that I see the opportunities. And there's a couple of things that I've learned in this space around, I guess it's identity, uh, which then flows into work, is that there's still about a billion people without an ID, so even a passport. And so the future potential of this with that 7.7 .7 billion people, there's so many challenges in you know, Australia itself around the future of work and identity at work that we can solve. But then the ripple effect of that, that that's going to have on the rest of the world is quite significant. Are there any big challenges that you can help and educate me on that uh, um, exist in this space in that 7.7 .7 billion people that you'd love to see solved with technology? Yeah, good question. Yeah, there's lots of challenges there. So you know, you've talked about the identity piece, but also access to technology, right? So access to, to web-based applications and even just familiarity with technology too. You know, we're operating in geographies like Papua New Guinea where, you know, there's one phone per village. And, and so, you know, if you need to connect with people, it's very hard to do. And so this is where I think there's no silver bullet here, but combinations of technology. So for example, facial recognition might make up for the fact that someone doesn't have a unique identifier around uh, a mobile phone number or an email address. Um, and, and maybe we can start anchoring the identity of an individual around that. Um, and, and in my view, we've, we've set up a model where whilst we're trying to empower the individual to keep their information up to date and, and so forth, um, you know, the ability for organizations who are trusted by that individual to keep their profiles up to date on their behalf um, is a big opportunity there so that over time, as these individuals do become easily more easily able to be identified, there's already a profile that's been being built by others on their behalf and they can essentially take ownership over that a few years down the track when, when the time's right, when they have a smartphone or when they have the ability to do it or when they have more unique identifiers. So um, that's the way we're kind of hedging our bets there is to make sure whilst we have a user-centered model around the individual that over time, um, you know, those that don't have that privilege can still have a profile built. They can still have a single source of truth that trusted organizations build on their behalf and, and they can connect with it down the line. How long do you think it will take for those populations to have a mobile phone each, to have access to technology, to be able to be educated and, and, um, and I guess more uh, equality in the world in this space? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? 20? Yeah, look, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to be binary, right, whether, whether, whether I've got equality or not, but I, I certainly think in the next five years, it's going to continue to be big leaps and bounds ahead. Um, and I think some of these developing countries are going to basically leapfrog some of the things that took us 20 years to do because they don't need all the hard cabling in the ground. For example, you know, you've got, you know, tech entrepreneurs, you know, like the Elon Musk of the world that are that are building, you know, all these satellites, micro satellites that they're launching to sit over parts of Africa and so forth, where where people can get the necessary connectivity, which is which is one of the baseline um, enablers. So. I think as all those initiatives start coming where people get access to, to the internet and connectivity is devices get cheaper and cheaper. It, it always amazes me every time I go to a developing country, how many people actually have phones and, and decent smartphones too and countries where their income levels are way, way different to what we're used to. Somehow they've still managed to afford an $800 smartphone, you know? Um, so I think, I think it's going to keep evolving more and more. And as, as these individuals get plugged into to the internet, to the um, to the world's sort of ecosystem of technology, where there's more and more remote work happening, um, and and we've got countries like ours, as we talked about before, that are just desperate for skills. Those people will either start to migrate to some of these countries, or they'll be able to make it happen remotely because they're starting to get the tools and the toolkit to do that. So yeah, I, I definitely can see that continuing to take leaps and bounds over the next five, 10 years for sure. Brilliant. So now I've got the big question for you. 
So you're imagining that it is the year 2041. So you're in that year, you've just woken up. And based on our conversation today, what do you do and what does the world look like? Yeah, so when I think of think of waking up in in, in another 20 odd years time, like I, I feel like my main expectation is that I'm empowered. You know, I've, I've got access to data at my fingertips. I'm sort of waking up, there's you know, potentially touch screens around me and so forth where I can check things like weather and surf reports and schedule for the day and all that type of thing. And, and I'm connected and I'm not trying to work hard to bring together bits of information and communicate. So it's, it's kind of that connectivity around data, information at my fingertips and yeah, just, just truly letting data and information flow much more seamlessly. And if we can get it right with um, making sure everyone knows that, that, that I'm me, that we can get trusted networks set up where I, I've got really clear knowledge of who's got access to what. And I think that makes people's lives so much easier, whether you're applying for insurance or a home loan or whatever. If I've got my trusted credential set, data set on me, um, yeah, for me, that's, that's what I'd expect. Life's just going to be so much simpler without having to spend so much time imparting and receiving information that could have been at my fingertips. Definitely, I see the, the future planning as well for people. They can actually have confidence that if they go and they study something that, that it's going to be able to be put to use and the productivity that can be saved in um, having purpose and knowing that you're contributing to what the world needs. Very cool. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and you know, I talked about it before, but you know, that whole innovation for impact thing, like I, I take great satisfaction in knowing that you know, if, if we do our job well and we continue to evolve the way we're doing, just that ability to connect people to organizations in a really efficient way, whether they're volunteering or providing aged care support or whatever it might be, um, you know, that'd be really satisfying for me if we can just streamline that whole process and empower people and, and give organizations a chance to, you know, reduce their risk um, and cost of doing business as well. And I think, you know, that just creates space for much more innovation, for more you know, output from our economy, um, more good to be done if, if, if it's in the social purpose space. So, yeah, look, I think it's an exciting future. And, and if we all keep focusing on solving the problems rather than trying to apply a technology and find a problem for the technology, then then I think we'll be fine. And that's, that, that's kind of the key for me is, um, yeah, really doubling down on on the problems we're trying to solve, how we solve them and, and accumulating technology to solve that rather than here's a shiny object, let's let's find a, a use case for it. If, if we focus on that, I don't think we can go wrong. Brilliant. So a lot of our audience are investors, they're corporates, governments or startups. Do you have any messages for any of those? Yeah, probably... We're always interested in discussions. If, if it's a if it's an area of, of interest for any of those stakeholder groups, um, you know, be it government or organisations or even investors, you know, we want to link arms with as many on that journey. You know, next year we'll be, um, you know, starting to eye up a, a fundraising round as well from an investor side, but also you know we're really keen to talk to governments as well to uh, to share our knowledge. We've spent eight years thrashing out this problem and and we know it's not as simple as you know grab a piece of technology off the shelf and and drop it in there's there's a lot of nuances to this so yeah more than happy to knowledge share with government or industry bodies to to share what we know and if we can help unlock some of these problems be it future skill shortages or keeping people safe at work or being more efficient collaboration whatever it may be yeah yeah the arms extended from our side for sure Amazing. Thank you. And I know uh, my message is always for investors. I'd love to see a lot more impact investing. And we're talking a lot about profit and purpose now and meeting founders like yourself who are looking at solving big world problems, but getting so much traction 
in those, uh, you know, in that journey of solving those big problems, definitely. And then also the message for startups as well. If you're starting a business, if you're on your journey of a business and you're not getting that traction, how do you actually adjust and pivot to be able to understand, you know, what those big problems are? Because you can you can see the traction that you're getting with all of the awards and everything by finding that niche and finding that big problem that is going to help a lot of people. Yep, totally agree, totally agree. So my last question is just, do you have a closing thought that you'd like to leave our audience with? Yeah, my, my closing thought um, is probably what I, what I spoke about before. You know, if we focus on the, on the people rather than the sort of profitability elements and, and sort of make an impact on, on the people, empower them, give them meaningful work, um, give them something that excites them at the start of the day, then I think you know, if we have more of the workforce doing that, We'll, we'll create some great outcomes because people will be motivated to to learn and grow and solve problems rather than just turn up and collect a paycheck and, and live for the weekends and the holidays. So, yeah, that's that's been my light bulb moment that, that I'm going to sort of keep keep leaning deeper into is, is people not profit basically, and 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 the results will come if if I do that well. That's really inspiring. I know that I'm definitely inspired from our conversation. I want to say a huge thank you to you, Matt, for joining us. And thank you to everyone else uh, who's joining us on A Future by Design, helping us to create the future by design and also having the conversations that are um, gaining momentum. So, uh, so grateful. So thank you again, Matt, and thanks to everyone. Likewise. Thanks, Lisa. Re really enjoyed the discussion too. Thanks for uh, hosting these. It's great, great to get the uh, knowledge sharing happening. So thank you. Amazing. See you soon.